Welcome back to The Watch. Good to see everyone. Hello. Let us know if you can hear us. Mm -hmm. The usual live stream thing really is testing, testing, making sure this is all working fine. But I can see some of our channel members in the chat using those, those gorgeous emotes. And I uh, lost tails. I'm a member of the other channel and I started tripping when I couldn't use the emojis. <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate the support, um, especially on Shadowfisty and Night's Watch. Absolutely. And so let us know if we are coming in loud and clear. We can hear you fine. Nice. Uh, Day with us says, hello there. Is that is it, is it the right? Is it, that was the is right. It, is it hello there or is it hello there? I think I'm getting pretty good at that. It's going to be the latter always. Well, you know, you've got the beard as well. So you just got to, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kikoman with a super chat already for two dollars. Show me, show you, Kikoman. I had some soy sauce the other day with yeah. some uh, dumplings. Same. Oh, did you? I had for dinner last night. Oh, some look. fried rice, dumplings, and soy sauce. It was good. Local news already. Any other local news you want to share, Nathan? Oh, a few things, I guess. The collab video came out. I, I, oh, um, cool. link to the description. And for those who are fans of this channel and the Chativersity, <laughs> we'll see. On my lunch break, I basically put on a Gamerson and the thing to do a little intro for them <laughs> behind the castle. And so, <laughs> perks of working here, I guess, I can use nice, some nice. Of the equipment. So that was a fun little video that I did. Um, another another funny thing that's been happening. So, last, well, this week was Anzac Day. Yes. Uh, and the night before, I had a in-law uh, gathering, and we do poker night with the boys. <laughs> now... A lot of people have probably have no idea what Anzac Day is. Yeah, Anzac. Oh, it's. Oh, is it like um? So it, the Anzacs is the Australian New Zealand Army Corps. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, Australian, but that's not exactly what the acronym is. Um. But A N is Australian New Zealand. Uh, um. No, it might be Army Corps. Army Corps. <laughs> I, might, I, I think that's right. right. Yeah. Um. And. Uh, the Anzacs were uh, the uh, group that, you know, went and fought in World War II. Died in a lot in Gallipoli, unfortunately. And uh, so Anzac Day is a day to remember their sacrifice. Mm. It's kind of like Veterans Day, I guess, for those who may be mm. in the States or something. Yeah. And yeah. that's similar It's, it's kind of like our Veterans Day. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I, I absolutely love Anzac Day, remembering uh, the brave people that, you know, sacrificed themselves in horrible wars in the past. Um, but anyway, so yes, you have a tradition. <laughs> we had a poker game. We do it like occasionally every couple of months just to like keep, you know, brotherhood together. But Anzac Day made sense to, you know, have a later night beforehand. Um, and this funny thing happened where we were all, because it ranges from like me, early 20s to like late 50s. And we had this discussion about push-ups. And for some reason now in, in a month's time, we're going to have a competition. <laughs> for who can do the most push-ups. <laughs> and so every day now, I've been incrementing my push-ups five up. I haven't done push-ups in about two years, Shad, since working here. <laughs> and so when I went down the floor to a push-up, it was a, a shocking reality. But now, I've gone up between a few days. Ooh, so yeah. far, I've... It's, it's, it's interesting how you do five more each day and you think the next day, oh, you know, I'm going to hit the wall. But you don't. Mm -hmm. It's cool to see. So that's my other personal news. I'm doing push-ups again. There we go. So, personal news on my front, uh, the family is up to uh, um, Breaking Dawn Part 2 in uh, the Twilight Saga. One film left, and wow. they're all on board. <laughs> they love it. <laughs> it's, it's like, we weren't expecting it, but okay. Twilight just has this... It's this thing, has it speaks this to thing. them. It does. It's like, like and re-watching it again, like, the writing... And even though there's some of the film things in the first film, bad. Mm. <laughs> bad. <laughs> oh, I can see why it got as popular as it did. I just, because uh, you're not up to the part where you see the baby at the end, the CG baby. I uh, know that is that you see the CG baby at the end of uh, Breaking Dawn Part One. Because if, if I saw that as a kid, I would get nightmares. The imprinting like, and stuff. Yeah. But uh, my kids were they they were like try to predict what would happen and and they're all invested in like the different powers and and uh, yeah that's funny that's funny <laughs> so, yeah so we could have lots of discussions on twilight you're getting ready for the uh, tv show aren't you when the tv show comes out all the kids are going to watch it too yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> um 
So still working on name pending All Star. We had a uh, I don't know who was there for the live stream on Shadowversity, but we had a bit of a discussion on the naming of Shadowversity, and it's down to two names. Mm. Um, uh, because like I, I've conceded that All Star has an issue with search and discoverability. That's kind of the being the tipping point for me, right? Mm. And uh, but proposing Tales of All Star kind of fixes a lot of the issues and. People really like that. And so now it's a battle between that and the All Saga. Should I do a poll for this stream uh, as well? For this one? How many do we have in? We have got 175 viewers. Good to see everyone here. Yeah, I'll be interested. Uh, Tales of All Star versus the All Saga. What do you guys think? And uh, I've also just been doing little things. I'm still trying to uh, make concept work for the uh, outfits and all the stuff, fleshing out the world. Working a little bit on the story. Um, the All Saga, isn't it? The All Saga, yes. The All Saga. Nice. So, which which one do you prefer? And uh, always, always love getting your feedback, everyone. So uh, that's up now. There is a, a member. Is that a member comments? Ah, uh, that's a new member. New member. Welcome to. Uh, welcome. To the watch, uh, Janie Fuller. We appreciate you. Thank you for becoming a member. Um, and because they don't actually come up when we're doing um, super chats, doing super chats yeah. and stuff, and so we're going to try and pay more attention to uh, members uh, and gifts and stuff like that. Uh, and shout out. So how's the poll going already? We already have some. The all saga is winning, but you usually got to give it a little bit for people. So, yeah, because you get the fusional first two few clicks, and uh, also. I heard this thing where when you're doing polls, there's actually bias depending if you do the first one, people are more likely to pick that one. Oh, really? That's it's just a weird psychological thing. Well, it doesn't thing. seem to be going that way. I, like, no. Um, the old saga does seem to be more popular. That's what that we found on Shadowversity. Mm. Um, and so here as well. And I do like it. I just, yeah. It's like, what are you thinking? I like there, Tales then? of All Star because it feels more, I don't know. The old saga feels like a, a, a slug to me. It's like, like it's going to be 18 books. I have to read all the story <laughs> to cover all of We're like tales. It's like I can pick up, you know, one of the graphic novels and just enjoy it for what it is. Like it feels like a tale. <laughs> Bedtime story rather than a library of books that, you know, I need to study. <laughs> so we have a bit to get to in this uh, nicely news slash Night's Watch live stream. And uh, so first off, I want to share some of our thoughts. Um on Picard season three, Mandalorian. And uh, man, I'd like to do a dedicated review, but we're really shut for time. Mm. And so uh, not sure you, but I guess we, we can do what we can here. Uh, Picard season three, you haven't watched it, I assume. No. It is, uh, wow, what an interesting thing to consider, okay? Because it's not perfect by any means. And on a technical level, there are certainly questions in terms of the plot, mm. right? But there's basically no, you know, woke, um, subversive stu uh, stuff in it. And, oh, in terms of um, emotional satisfaction in treating beloved characters well, brilliantly done. Mm. And it does some things really well in terms of the plotting in, with setups and payoffs. Episode three, I think, is the one in particular where they have just this beautiful setup and payoff, you know, the no-win scenario, and they pull it out, and it's just, oh, that payoff was so great, so great. And then... The continuing mystery was done really well. Um, there, uh, do you mind spoilers? No, I don't. Yeah, tell yeah, me. Yeah, like we're gonna have to go into spoilers uh, to review some of the key parts in Picard season three. One, like, oh, I'll try and get to non-spoiler things first, and so I can continue on some of the things. I like, I have not watched Picard season one and two, and I'll refuse to watch it. You mm. know, like, um, things that make a mockery of um, beloved characters and franchises. I'm, so done with it. Um, and uh, that's exactly what the reports have been for Picard season one and two and nearly all other Star Trek. I've tr I have tried watching a couple of episodes of Discovery, I, you know, when it first came out. Uh, I, can't, I still can't believe that they allowed for the acronym for Discovery to be STD. <laughs> it's like they're not aware or they're so aware that they do it on purpose. I can't tell now. Like, it's too hard. Oh my gosh. Um, and then I, I even tried a couple of episodes of Strange New Worlds. Mm. 
couldn't get into it, couldn't get into it. And so just skipped a card one at season one and two. And season three was so delightful because basically it's like season one and two doesn't exist. You don't need to watch them. You can just pick up. Like, to me, this is the, the canon of what picks up after the next gen films. It's like that nothing else exists. And they do such respect uh, to the characters, giving every character something important to do as they come back, uh, which was really fulfilling. And I was actually a little surprised, a little surprised at how much nostalgic affection I still have for these characters. Mm. Like to, to realize the affection I have for these characters while watching them. And then the joy I had in seeing them be respected and, sh and still get, you know, um, uh, I guess moments to shine. I, I even this cold black jaded heart of mine could still be. <laughs> and because we're, we're at a point in media where you, you almost have to prepare for everything to be just. You got to prepare for the worst, basically. Yeah. To be belittled, to be uh, crapped on and everything. Look what they did to Luke. Look what they did to Han. Look what they did to the main characters in Wheel of Time. Look what they did to Halo. Rings of Power. Did Rings of Power. Like, it's all awful. Um, and and so, um, I I, I was just basically, re you know, ready for the worst, whatever. And I wasn't ready for <laughs> being treated well. And then that, oh, it's so good to see the characters I love because these characters are great. We're watching um, Next Generation with my kids. Mm. So it's not just Twilight, okay? Um, A balance of both good and bad. <laughs> yes. And they are loving Next Gen. And Next Gen is great. Ah, oh, the characters. Um, and even just good themes and messages and, and stuff in it. The universal morals that we all would want in media. Uh, Next Gen is just overflowing with it. And so we are at a point with our kids where we're just not watching... Oh, I, I, they do watch, you know, current stuff, but we're being far more, I guess, selective what we are letting them watch now because you can't trust what's on YouTube. You mm -hmm. can't trust what's on Netflix. You can't trust. And so, all right, embrace tradition. Get back to the old school stuff. And there is heaps of stuff there, like a world's worth of entertainment. I grew up on it, and so it was enough for me, and so we can certainly share that with our kids. And so, yeah, we're getting him into Next Gen. We've watched um the... uh original series movies as well. Uh, so they know who Kirk is and some of even the original series episodes. So they'll be, uh, they'll know who is who when we get to the, the next gen movies and Kirk comes in in generations. movies. Yeah. So back on to Picard season three, some really, really good, good stuff, really good storytelling, but it's not perfect. There are some, what, what, what? Uh, and what frustrated me, they, they are the type of plot hole things that could have been fixed if, uh, I don't know, simple lines of word there. So data, it, it comes back. Uh, this is, we're in spoilers now, okay? And the way they bring him back was somewhat reasonable, but then really, really weird. Mm -hmm. So they need to go, get into this institute that has like um, all of Starfleet's, um, you know, uh, dangerous tech that they've found across whatever, or they want to hide things away and everything of it, a uh, facility where everything is hidden there. And uh, a weapon was supposedly stolen from this facility that the next gen crew need to find out what was stolen and why. So they need to sneak into this facility as well. And they constantly told that it is protected by one of the most advanced AI systems ever. And I'm like, okay, I can see where you're going with that because you'll find out the AI is data. And his positronic net and everything like that, yeah, it would be one of the most advanced AI. It's like, I can kind of see you're going with that. But then you find out the version of data that is in control of it is a combination between data, law, and one of the other datas. But law is the evil one. Yeah. And uh, and uh, the and also uh, Nunian Sung, I think. No, no, that's I'm getting them mixed up. But the guy that made data, it's like a mesh of their personalities. And it's like, well, hang on, does that mean Starfleet gave partial control o over some of the most dangerous things in the world to a, a version of data that has evil law in it, like this really sadistic evil thing? Mm, like, okay, you know, I was like. Mm. Yeah, there are small things like that that you would be able to fix if you just restructured, you know, that maybe it was only data here. 
all right? But he wasn't, they couldn't wake him up. And, there were, and then there, there was a parts of law to the side, like that wasn't connected to the controlling facility, but they grabbed all the data pieces when they found, found him. And they realized the only way to wake up him is to integrate the personalities. And then it, the story right. can continue as before, uh, because data does go through an arc because the personalities do eventually get merged and he has laws, um, ability for emotion and, uh, and understanding human, uh, interactions and things. Um, and so you could fix that. I, I, there are small things like that. And, and so, oh my gosh, one of the best moments ever for me. I, and this is like nostalgia through the roof. Picard season three does crazy, crazy member berries, but it does it right. Okay. This isn't jangling keys. Okay. To draw you in because there's nothing else of substance in it. There's a lot of good substantive, um, meat in this story. And, and arcs that the characters go on as well, and they grow, and uh, you're invested. And there's new characters introduced that are really fun and engaging. Um, I should say on an aside, the worst character in terms of representing the original characterization of these was Seven of Nine. Uh, for me, she wasn't Seven of Nine. <laughs> she was a completely different character. Um, and I think that was kind of built up by Picard season one and two, because I know she's in season one and two. Yep. Uh, but okay, biggest member berry, and it's just like, so just, it was awesome, right? They bring the Enterprise D back. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that one I can, like, Geordi has been rebuilding it, and he's in control of the Starfleet Museum, and people are like, I've heard some people try and criticize, like, what, Geordi just had this side project rebuilding. I think none of, this could easily be justified because the Enterprise-D is a piece of Starfleet history mm. and a really important ship to have in, in the museum. And so I think absolutely they'd be on board with either they don't have money but funding, whatever, allowing resources to rebuild the Enterprise-D. Absolutely. I think that would definitely be part of that. So that's not an issue. Uh, the issue is when they, like, and it's so awesome to see it back in here. Cool. Do they have a long sequence of like showing it off? Oh yeah. yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they milk it for the right amount and it's a, it's just so great to see, but there are questions. There are questions that get raised with the enterprise D coming back. It's like, doesn't it need the full crew to operate is the first thing. Good. Cool. Yep. Yep. Um, it's weapon systems will not be as strong as, and you know, um, as, a, as uh, modern ships and stuff. So will it really be able to hold its own? Um, and uh, there are just small things that you could have justified because there's like this name, little thing that Jordy mentions where he says drones are restocking the torpedoes and, and stuff like that. And even if they said that they have like, um, like th there's a temporary, uh, uh, holographic crew, like they, you know, cause th th that technology is already in Starfleet because they have doctor's mobile emitter and stuff like that. And they say, it's not going to be as adaptive or as functional as a, as a human crew, but they'll be able to get the work done for mm. us and make the ship operate. A simple line drop like that, pothole solved, not a problem. And same with the weapons. Like, Jordy could say, you know, she, she was a, 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 the old, you know, weapon systems, um, they can fire the new torpedoes. Like, I, we're just so we're just restocking with other weapons, and I didn't, well, you know, when I was uh, repairing the phaser arrays, I didn't, I upgraded it. It's so, like, just... Simple little line jumps would, would fix um, a lot of it. Uh, but seeing it back in action was just awesome, awesome. And there are other things you can try and explain away why, because it does get into some fighting, right? Um, then another spoiler, I've already mentioned spoilers and everything. They come across the Borg again, mm -hmm. and the Borg cube that they find seems to be like this Frankenstein reconstruction of multiple Borg cubes and everything. And the Borg aren't exactly on their A game. They're, they're struggling a bit because of uh, a certain virus that um, uh, was uh, the end of uh, Voyager. And they, they could explain that either it's suffering with power, so the Borg's weapon systems aren't as great or something like that. But there's a lot of ways they could have explained if they just a uh, simple line to uh, explain why the Enterprise D is holding its own so well against a freaking giant Borg cube. Um, people are trying to describe that. I, again, there's a criticism that the Enterprise D is basically... A, um, a, a trench run. So, mm -hmm. you know, Star Wars, classic trench run on the Death Star, but yep. it's more like um, a Return of the Jedi where they need to fly into the Death Star. Right. Enterprise D does that, but on a Borg cube. And I'm all for it. It looks so, it was fun. And one of the reasons is, is that when, you know, um, Next Gen was made, the uh, special effects technology, they didn't have the budget to really show the Enterprise 
fly in glorious detail and stuff like that. And then we didn't really get to see that even in Generations before we had to say goodbye to the Enterprise D. And so having opportunity to see the Enterprise D just go full throttle, right? And then depict it and you can see it in all its glory. Yeah. It's a fan's wet dream. You're just like, yeah! Like, it's so much fun. And I... With Data behind the helm, I think you can justify it flying the way it is. Yeah, because right. Because Data is just going crazy. Um, and the arc that Data has um, to uh, justify why he's willing to risk flying this way is great. Okay. Because, man, the, the care and attention they have in Picard Season 3 for just plot points and character growth and everything past is like, back in, in Next Gen, there's moments where Jordy would say, you know, I, we need to do this. I can feel it in my gut. And Data would be like, in your gut? What does that mean? What does that mean? Or when Data says that he wants to fly the Enterprise D into the Borg cube this way, and Geordi's like, no, what you, like, this is crazy. Data says, then do it. It's, just, it's a gut feeling. It's in my, and so th there's, there's just these payoffs that are set up back in the series that are in this, that are just done with such care and attention. It's chef's kiss. And uh, things like that. So even though you can absolutely find areas where you have a raised question mark and stuff like that. To me, they are kind of on this scale. And look, I do need to try and question myself. Like, like am I unbalanced in my analysis here? Because I am appreciating and loving so many things in Picard because of some nostalgia and stuff like that. Am I getting a stronger emotional reaction that's unbalancing my assessment versus the criticisms? I don't know, possibly. I have to acknowledge that it could be a possibility. But when I try and look at it objectively, I do feel a lot of the points of criticisms are not actually that big when uh, they get so much right. And I have already mentioned this in kind of reviews that um, when something is all a dumpster fire, okay, it makes the errors and plot holes just even worse because yeah. it's like salt in the wound and, and everything. But when it's a show that's really, really good, it makes it easier to not even notice or, or care about certain plot holes or uh, elements that, you know, didn't work uh, good in the story because everything else is just so fun and satisfying. And I very much get that kind of um, impression out of Picard season three because it, it did justice to the characters and uh, has a great payoff. And it was just, ah, oh, it was beautiful. I loved it. I loved Picard season three. Um, and so I'd almost give it, yeah, the eight out of 10. Um, that's, that's high for you sometimes. <laughs> and like in terms of enjoyment, nostalgia, fan, fan service that you really love it. It's like nine out of 10, 10 out of 10, almost in like enterprise D, D enterprise D. Um, there were some things I wish they could have done to really like, because if the enterprise D comes back, right. Instead of putting it back in mothballs and stuff because the titan which is the main ship that people are on for most of the season you do end up really liking the titan i like the titan it's, you already know spoilers right? um they rename the titan the enterprise um uh, it becomes the new the new enterprise right um and uh well there's actually two there's three enterprises in the whole season because there was a, a new flagship enterprise which was the enterprise f gets destroyed pretty quickly out of the gate. And so the Titan becomes the Enterprise G. And uh, I was thinking, like, we know the people who made this have watched the end of Star Trek Next Gen, and you see uh, a future version of the Enterprise, and it's like, surely couldn't someone, like, like you have the Enterprise D back, and it's, someone could say, you know, the Enterprise D has certain features in just its structure, the way it's built, the way its engines are integrated with the systems, that it is actually performing based on its um, energy to output at a higher efficiency than even some of the modern ships. We could modernize this thing and really crank it up to 11. But to balance out uh, the, the new, you know, if we put, give it a new warp core and everything, it's going to overload the system. So to balance it out, we'll need to give it a third nacelle and... Uh, and uh, there's even an option to channel the, the warp, you know, core into a really powerful directional weapon and stuff. And they could make the Enterprise that we saw at the end of the next gen um, and bring her back into, uh, into service. That would just have been, ah, oh, the cherry on the cake for me. I feel like the show has been such a fan. Obviously, you've seen the love and effort he's had for the characters. And how he knows stuff from the other series, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he kept going. That would... <laughs> 
if you pitch it to him, he'd be like, yeah, okay, let's do it. Well, the, the sad, sad reality of all this is that this is seems to be a fluke. Mm. The guy who made Picard season three was only given hit this opportunity because the people in control of Star Trek was basically ready to give up on the show. It wasn't doing well. And they just said, do whatever you want. We don't care. Mm. And then they gave it to someone who really loves Star Trek and he just hit it out of the park. And yeah. he has just, just like Kurtzman, the guy who's in charge of Star Trek, basically egg on his face completely because mm. he has made all this crap that everyone hates. Yep. Right. And he's still in control. And then this, this guy, this new guy comes and, and makes something better. just shows him up. And everyone wants a spinoff sequel series to Picard season three. And that means he would have to acknowledge and I don't think he's going to do that because he's in control. Yeah. And so the only way I can see it, if Paramount higher ups people, someone above him says, no, 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 we, we, this is great. The fans have loved it. And then, you know, um, force uh, the spinoff to go because Picard season three ends with the Titan getting renamed the Enterprise mm -hmm. um, e, uh, G, Enterprise G. And um, Jack He's now in Starfleet, which is awesome. Uh, Seven is the captain. Um, and if they did, uh, they'd need to bring, like, have Seven. I don't know, explain why she's so different and get some of the original Seven characters back. And uh, Raffi is the second in command and stuff. And I'm fine with that. And there have been some people who've even try been trying to say, it's woke. Look, it's got the, you know, women in charge of the new Enterprise. Stuff like that. And I'm like, are you crazy? Like, this is, again... Uh, people who are trying to push back against the woke movement, we can go too far, and it seems like you're just trying to go up, you know, support a narrative when you call any, you know, female character who is prominent in the show, it's woke when, no, no, you can just have prominent female characters in the show. Like Janeway, being the captain of the Voyager, mm. wasn't woke. She was a fun captain, good captain. So a lot of people like Voyager the least. I actually really love Voyager. Um, as a series and uh, not because of the characters. I think that Voyage actually does have some of the weakest characterization, but I love some of the sci-fi sci kind of plots that they really indulge in in a lot of the episodes where mm -hmm. there's some really higher concept kind of sci-fi um, tropes happening and stuff. And I really enjoy that, uh, those elements about Voyager. Um, and, and same, like Elite Battle Angel is a great character. Like it's not woke just because I, and often... Geeks have loved strong female characters from the beginning. And so with, when it comes to that, it's like, no, this actually makes sense with the structure of the story and uh, with where everyone was at. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, you need to kind of see the reasons why, like, because Jack wasn't denigrated, wasn't belittled and everything. One of the reasons why you can tell if uh, it is woke, right, based on them pushing a kind of, girl boss, you know, female representation, too far and stuff like that, is are the male characters around them belittled and denigrated just to prop them up, okay? Also, how they behave. Are they Mary Sue's? Are they unreasonably competent? Stuff like that, where we basically see these characters propped up beyond what is reasonable mm. or good storytelling. Then we can say they're, they're only pushing this stuff because of woke reasoning uh, behind and stuff. But if it actually makes sense in the story, which has been the key qualifier, like I know I've said for ages, if it makes sense for the story uh, for the character to either be female or to be the leader or everything like that, or to be the kickback action hero, awesome, okay? This is why people try and straw man, um, people like us who push back against the woke narrative, right? Saying, if aliens came out now, you would call it woke. It's like, no, no, we wouldn't, because did I call the leader battle angel woke? Okay, like uh, there's been like shows that we call House of the Dragon woke. No, because when it is uh, makes sense for the story and structure, okay, and the characters behave and all the characters are treated well and stuff, clearly no. Mm -hmm. And that's why this is the point of evidence why um, uh, Aliens or, or Buffy or, or any of the classic shows that have strong female characters that come out, we wouldn't call that woke either because it's not, all right? You can easily identify if it has the propagandic message behind it based on how they treat the other characters around them, are they set up with proper arcs or are they Mary Sue's? Um, all of those things. All mm. those things is how you can qualify that. And so overall, Picard season three, loved it. Chef's Kiss. But there is another show that has concluded around the same time as Picard season three. And in fact, it's another season three of something. Yeah. It's Amanda, right? Yes, we're okay, talking good. about <laughs> Mandalorian. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. 
So here is a case in point, like a contrast as to uh, why you can tell something might be woke versus something not being woke. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are female characters in Picard season three that end up being in positions of leadership at the end. Yep. And it makes sense for the story in Picard season three. Okay. Uh, and it would just be, uh, it, Jack is only entering Starfleet. So he's not going to get command of the, to, uh, of the new enterprise over seven, who was already the second in command. Mm. And she gets a massive recommendation comment. Don't get me wrong. I love Shaw and I think like, I would have actually, Shaw is a stronger character and I would have preferred Shaw to be still captain. Um, he's a new captain that's introduced. Okay. But for Seven's arc, I can see why, what they did with Shaw. Like, uh, and uh, that payoff at the end where he gives a recommend, the commendation basically for Seven um, was a really powerful, good emotional moment. And Seven is a legacy character. Okay. So... I could absolutely see why they were thinking Seven is the better character to be the, the captain. And it's not for woke reasons. I can see very logical through lines, even though I would actually probably prefer Shaw as the captain because it was such a fun character. And I think they misfired with Seven's execution. Um, so look at this. We can see female character being put in position of leadership for what makes sense in the story and how things play out. But in Mandalorian, we also see a female character now taking a position of leadership. And one of the constant constant things in mandalorian season three is that the way that they prop up this female character is by making the main male protagonist look like an incompetent moron i mean there's other issues with it too that i don't like about mando season three yeah, but, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. Like a... but out of all the seasons he looked the most incompetent in this, this one, one yeah above all other seasons like he gets, he falls into traps. He needs to get rescued. And it's just the plotting is, is so dumb. And it's all to make bo look awesome. Right. And I can't, I, I hate this. And I, 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 it gives me wheel of time season one, you know, things where the way that they make the female characters so great is not by writing the world, not making public, but by making all the male characters around them look incompetent idiots and cowards and all this stuff. Yeah. That's a big portion of Mandalorian season three. I mean, I uh, I have many issues with it. The fact that they built up to nothing and then they try to build up something. It was like a wet fart. They're like, yeah. <laughs> and then you're gonna. Oh, well, Gideon's back. No, he's not. Oh. Yes, he is. Maybe he's a clone. Who knows? I did not like Moff Gideon ever. I, I could from see or every time he's appeared. And it's because he's miscast. The actor, I think, is a fine actor in the right role. He, this is the worst role for him ever. And they want him to be like Darth Vader 2.0. And he cannot carry it. He is not menacing or intimidating one bit. He looks like an accountant. And he speaks like an accountant. This is not Darth Vader. And so it is there like, you know, uh, bo Katan, I am going to... Or something like that. It's just like, dude, no. Ah, oh, it's just weak. <laughs> you're you're right, and I I don't know. I think my grabs are very different from yours because obviously you have more like more story and character. For me, it's like this is where Star Wars is heading now. Like <laughs> hour long episodes on Coruscant about guys just oh, chilling on. It was so disjointed and so lost. This mm. show, this season, did not know what it wanted to be, and so the first few episodes was just meandering filler, pointless crap. And a lot of it is because they were so desperate they have to have Baby Yoda back and they yeah. contradict the arc of the first two seasons and then they have key important episodes to explain how he's back in Boba, Boba Fett. Fett. Oh. See, now, I would have maybe thought it was okay. Like with season two, they kind of just went on a milk run for most of the series and then at the very end, Luke shows up and it was really cool. I was waiting for something to happen at the end. I wanted... Uh, if they killed Mando off and, and someone else came to replace me, the new Mandalorian, okay, I would have been very angry, but at least I would have felt something. It also would have been awesome to have someone sacrifice himself and have a cool story or Grogu to say something, just something to happen. But the end of the season was he goes to like a retirement home, <laughs> kills, and Grogu's just using the force. And like, that's it. And Mandalorian's a Mandalore now. And ah, was... and the arc of this season, it was what they're wanting to try is like, they're retaking of Mandalore and stuff like that. It's like, you could have, 
Because to get to to make that work, right, you need the audience invested in the end goal. Mm. I didn't give a stuff about them retaking the Andor, and so the way that you integrate it is is any number of reasons. One, they could have found out that um, the remnants of the Empire were actually mining Beskar early on in the season, and it's like holy crap, we need to get them off Mandalore because they're making troops and everything like that, and so fell completely flat with the reveal of oh, new stormtroopers with uh, Beskar armor that suddenly it's much even though they are able to block blaster bolts they still die from blaster bolts and it's like <laughs> logic in that oh uh, it's and that could have been fixed with one simple line it frustrates me this and this is more pivotal because the the, the combat between them and these um storm new stormtroopers with the with the beskar armor is significant it's the climax it's the big fight okay and then you're just wondering why are they so much easy to kill and now the mandalorians and you just again one simple line right when they come up here din Djarin just say, says why are we able to blast them? I thought they're wearing Beskar. And then Bo-Katan says, they don't know how to refine it properly. It's not as strong. Problem solved. Done. Okay? They don't, like, they don't have the creativity or foresight or anything to do. And, and if, you, if people try and say that's the actual reason, no, no, that's called headcanon. Mm. That's you doing the job for the writers. Yeah. yeah this episode, <laughs> oh, this series felt very lazy to me, especially I even saw, like, I understand TV shows do this, but there was... What they did in the action sequence where Bo-Katan's like going through the corridors and the ship's flying down, it's the same shot. They reverse it back and forth though. So they switch between the, the ship falling and then her going there and then going there. And you can tell because the pauldrons are changing. Like, I, I would give that leeway, but the fact that they can't even do things like explain why they can shoot through Beskar armor and stuff like that just... It just adds to the lazy pile of, okay, clearly you're not there, putting in any effort. There are so many plot holes that I... That just you're watching it and you're just thinking, these people are dumb. Mm. I, I, there's a point when they get you know jumped by the uh, evil stormtroopers. This is like second last episode, and uh, a big blast door comes down and blocks them through, and they can't get through. And I'm sitting there the whole time thinking, Oh Katan, you have a dark saber. You can cut through very easily. Why don't you do that, bo -Katan? And they're still for ages they're just trying to shoot. They can't get through this blast door. Dang it. They're just trapped. And they just seem to forget that they have it. Then when the, it gets raised, they need to escape through the back door. And guess what bo -Katan does? Then she uses the dark she saber. She uses the dark saber. Uh -huh. Cuts all. And I'm just like, what are you doing? <laughs> These people right in this show. <laughs> and there were so many, like... <sighs> Things have been set up, like in, in Book of Boba Fett, even though it shouldn't have been. There was a whole thing with, man, like, Din Djarin, he needs to master the Darksaber because he doesn't know how to wield it. Mm -hmm. And then season three is, or actually, she has a Darksaber now because she's saving from the monster who took it from me. Here's a Darksaber. Yeah. And she's like, great, thanks. And then it breaks at the end. I, they want, they want Bo-Katan to be the new Mandalorian. They said, like, like the Mandalorian doesn't mean just one person. Yeah. Right? This is in the social media stuff. And so they're desperate to change the the main character and this is one of the classic like we need oh, a female character plays a male character and stuff and the issue is Din Djarin isn't an interesting main character but neither is Bo-Katan like what's her personality apart from being you know pissed off and grumpy and I want to take Mandalore that's her personality and there are, like I know time for getting on this there's so many things about her character they ignore, like the fact that she's a terrorist and she's the reason that Mandalore's the way that it is. Like, if she didn't do any of this, Small wouldn't have showed up, Palpatine wouldn't have wiped them out. Like, yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> and there's like stuff in the show where she's like, yeah, actually, I asked them to surrender, but then they actually wiped us out anyways. I'm like, yeah, because you invited more to the planet and Palpatine blew it up. Like, you're not just... Uh... <clears throat> <laughs> Makes me mad. Makes me mad, Chad. And, I'm like... and so what they could have done, right, to salvage the series um, is uh, one of two ways. The better way is to just give um, Din Djarin more depth. Get, make, give him an arc. Make his personality come out that, I don't know, he didn't have an opportunity to get out. He's got a new dynamic with Grogu because he's learned to be a dad more or something mm. like that and make him a more fun, interesting, engaging character. Okay? They don't have the talent to do that. But, but that's what you ultimately would have wanted them to do. But if you're so desperate to replace him, which I'm not wholly against, because if you can't write an interesting character with Din Djarin, fine. Don't have him tag along like a useless wet doll simping after bo I will serve you. Kill him off and give bo like, Yes, 
fridge him. And by the way, fridging is not necessarily a bad thing because you can absolutely kill off characters to give other characters motivation and to either motivate Grogu or, or Bo-Katan on a quest to, and I don't know, defeat the Empire, get the mouth of Mandalore or something like that, have Din Djarin die getting the information to Bo-Katan that the Empire has infested Mandalore and they're using Beskar to make evil troops and they can overtake the galaxy again. That motivates Bo-Katan to go big on this epic quest and, and Grogu and all, all that stuff. I don't know the balls for that. I wouldn't do that either. Um, and again, the better option was to just make Din Djarin a more interesting character. Yeah. You built him up for two seasons and now to just have him sidelined, and not only sidelined, belittled, act like a bumbling idiot. Like he's walking into the waters of Mandalore, he trips and just starts to drown. Falls unconscious. Uh, like, we, and it was already established his helmet can seal and, and have breathing oxygen, but doesn't. Like, they are so inconsistent with the technology and the world building and everything. There are multiple examples I'll be able to give just after this, but this is just a clear one right here. He says he can seal his helmet so he can breathe in case of the toxic fumes, but now he's drowning because they want him to look like a, a, an incompetent buffoon. And who has to save him? bo -Katan. Second time she's saving him in that episode, by the way. Oh. And so they are ruining whatever investment you had in this character. And he wasn't a great character to begin with, but now you're just making him a bumbling, incompetent idiot for a lot of the season. Yeah. And there's just dumb stuff like at the end where like Grogu was going to go into the, the cult or whatever, the religion. Mm -hmm. And then Din Djarin's just like, I'm going to adopt him now. And like, this wasn't a thing he couldn't have done how, how many seasons ago. And this is a loophole, apparently. Like, if you can't find the parents, you can stop the kid and the kid's now your kid. And then you can just say to the kid, yeah, you're part of the creed now. So in terms of them not paying attention to the plot, sorry, the world building that they're doing, right? Yeah. Not a, I, I, there is like important world building elements that Star Wars loses the plot on in terms of like, you know, light speed rating and stuff like that. Whereas like, hang on, you need to be aware of the larger plot in the other movies and stuff. Mm. This show can't even keep track of its own plot in its own show. Yeah. Okay. Whereas they're, they're trying to do a jetpack after this monster that kidnapped a kid. And suddenly for the first time, they're running out of fuel. It's like, so there's a very, there's a set fuel limit on, on your jetpacks. And then in the last episode, a guy can use a jetpack and fly into orbit. And back. Yeah. And there's no fuel problem now. No. No, I don't know how that could happen, you know, because it's not like they were using the jetpacks before when they were on the base. You're not flying around or doing yeah. anything, so why would you not be fueled up? But then somehow you can fly into space. Yeah. That's a lot of fuel. It is. A lot of fuel. <laughs> so, considering that, I mean, another just massive one that I like. So you saw what happened to the Darksaber. Mm -hmm. Let's let the audience know what happens to the Darksaber in this season. So is it Bo-Katan holding it? She's holding it, yeah. yeah. And then what's his face? Uh, uh, Moff Gideon yep. just like breaks it in her hand. Just, just crushes it. It's broken. Yeah. Destroyed. She, so he crushes mm -hmm. Beskar Saber in her hand. Yes. But so, her hand's fine. So what Nathan just pointed out there, the lightsaber is made out of Beskar. This is established in the um, Boba Fett episodes where Din Djarin shows the blacksmith. She's like, made out of a Beskar. This thing should be, <laughs> you can't scratch it with your hands. <laughs> it's just like, they forgot it's made out of Beskar. But the fact that she was holding it, it's crushed, but her hands aren't crushed. Her either. hands are fine. <laughs> and so now Moff Gideon can do this? It's like her head would turn into jelly before they would ever be able to crush that dark saber. This show. Oh, Shake from the, is it the Hunger or something? Uh, hung hunger team, yeah. Shake from the Hunger team, gifted... Five memberships to the Night's Watch. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate you. Um, so, yeah, things like that. They can't even keep track of their own. Like, who is writing this stuff? Like, this is some of the most important stuff to keep track of with your world building and consistency to have investment. It's just stupid. <laughs> and then there is astronomical plot holes in stupidity where I, when they're facing off against the, the stormtroopers and the big guy says, there's too many of them or hold them back, right? We can't take them all. And so the assumption is not even the group of them could stop all these stormtroopers. Mm. And so they re retreat and this guy is supposed to be holding them back. He defeats them all yeah. on his own. Yeah. Like two men. You did on one. That means if you were all there, he could have wiped them out easy. And he would have been fine. And he would have been fine. This show is stupid, man. Oh my gosh. And there's... Uh... There's a few things I hated, like Grogu's little robot 
Robot Man, his little, his little, <laughs> somehow he can fight with that now. He can do all sorts of things. Uh, yeah. Just magic, you know, with two joysticks, you can do all this sort of stuff. Um, what other types of things? Just so many. So, uh, the new Star Wars game comes out this afternoon. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. And that's, once I finish that, I think I'm done. I'm thinking I'm really? hanging up my lightsaber after that. I'm <laughs> finished because Kathleen Candy has said we're making more sequels. All the stuff that you love, we're not going to do anymore. Like, it's almost like we need a new epic space opera that uh, gives us what we loved about Star Wars to fill yeah. the gap in our, our souls. And uh, what's the poll at? Poll is at the All Saga at 55%. It's a close one, though. I mean, there's still a lot of people that like Tales of All Star. I feel like you almost need to do like a um, a survey that aren't the viewers, like a, a anonymous survey. Almost. Yeah. Just, just let's see what the, the broader thoughts are for people. Yeah. After it, it's a t tough decision, but with where Star Wars is going, it's like we need something that will give us the, the space opera satisfaction that we, we need. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, and like, uh, I was almost wondering if I missed the boat with trying to produce this space opera uh, series because Star Wars was like. The sequels are, are past, uh, and so that, that was the worst Star Wars ever to really capture people's nostalgic love for what Star Wars used to be. It's like, nope, Disney is not dead. You know, take... Uh, They're going to beat the dead horse, I think. They're going to... They are. Uh, you thought they were done, you know, taking advantage of the Star Wars property, rafing it for all it's worth. <laughs> They're not done yet. They will dig up that corpse and go at it again and again. I said, like, all right, well... Uh, there's many opportunity for me to finish this. this and, project. you know, if it takes more, uh, after this next trilogy, if you're still working on it, there'll be another one and yeah. another one and another one. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If you just coincide your releases of the books with the yeah. releases of the, the shows, that'd be great. So Mandalorian Season 3 was just awful. It was just a terrible, terrible show. And... Uh, that's that's style. That was like one of their most more popular series, and they managed to butcher and ruin that. Comments that remind me of other stuff too, like chat with IG Twelve. Like he was a dead corpse. Grogu was in him, used him, then they somehow brought him back, and yeah. now he's just he's just there. He's the new marshal of. Um, oh yeah, because we kind of have someone else that was the marshal beforehand, and mm. you can clearly tell that um, whatever the volcano, they're trying to make that look like um, the Star Wars part of the park. What is it? I don't know. Um, oh, the, uh, Galaxy's Edge Galaxy's or something. Edge yeah, something like that. Um, they're desperate to try it. Oh, look, it, you can, it looks like you're you're at the um the Mandalorian planet. Well, guess what? No one like very few people like Mandalorian based on what you did at the end of that. Oh, and there's no build up. Like to me, it was Din Djarin's done. So the next season will just be uh, Bo Katan. I don't know, but they already took Mandalore. She doesn't have an epic quest, and so it seems like it's over. It does. Like at the end, it just felt like it was, well, uh, at the very end, there was like a, a, they did a transition with like so cool onto Grogu and then disappeared. Uh, Apparently yeah, that's yeah. like a end of a trilogy type thing. So it happens at the end of like, all right, part one of the Mandalorian arc is finished. Now we're on to part two of whatever. So I'm not excited because that was a very no, disappointing no, end. No, I'm not. And the new movie that they're going to make is, it's a Ray movie. <laughs> That's going to do great. <laughs> but keep doing what you're doing, Disney. You can have so much power to like be able to force everyone to make a Ray movie. Like you can't, you can't convince people to make that. You have to like force them to do that. <laughs> oh my gosh. So how are we going on the stream? We are at 50 minutes into it. Uh, we might be moving to Super Chats there, like, there, but there's so much to cover. We had, like, there, there was trailers. Trailers to... came out. I mean, The Witcher 3, you excited for that at all? Are we going to review that? Not a single bit. Like, I, I, this, Henry Cavill's out. Who cares about what we're going to do with The Witcher? I mean, did you see the um, poster where the main character, The Witcher, is in the, uh, in the background? Like, is the main character, and you're already sidelining side him in the poster. So we already see what you're doing with The Witcher. I didn't even get through Witcher Season 2. It's just like, you know. Um, 
And then... Uh, there was the Flash trailer the, as well. There's a new Flash trailer. There's... I mean, it just shows me more reasons not to want to go see it. Or wait, if I you know, wasn't doing this for a job, I wouldn't go see it. Like, I find it hilarious. The most interesting element of that film is not the Flash. No. It's the Flash film. It, it, it's Batman. It's Batman. People are going to see it. See Michael Keaton Batman. That was, I remember watching the new trailer and I read the comments to see, okay, is it being downvoted? Do people like, not like it? Mm. But no, everyone's like, I can't wait for this. I'm so excited to see Batman. Batman's the best part of this film. Then why is it a Flash <laughs> movie? It's just, if you actually made a Michael Keaton Batman film, just make a sequel to like the last been, one. It would have been like huge, a, like a gritty reboot. Oh, people would love oh, that. It would be so love that. That means I'd have three different Batman realities in film if they did that. Because <laughs> they got their own reboot Batman for what um, uh, whatever the guy's doing, I forget the name. Yeah, yeah. And then they have the Batman with Pattinson, and then they'll have old Batman, old Batman. but no Superman. He's fired. Yeah, yeah, right. Ah, oh, gosh. There's a new trailer for like the mermaid. The little mermaid oh, which, really? I uh, didn't see that one. I, know. I saw the posters that came out. Yeah. And... There's a new trailer for um uh, the next Transformers film. <laughs> we are uh, we have like a tidal wave of sludge coming our mm. way. Um, none of it looks good. <laughs> none of it does look good, does it? Yeah, but. Maybe we'll do decade videos or we can catch up on that on the next live stream. But uh, we'll get to uh, the super chats now because we appreciate you all. Um, While I get these up, one show I actually have been watching with the wife that has been surprisingly good mm -hmm. is the new Pokemon TV show. Oh, really? Uh, it, they, they, this is, so Ash is gone now. Mm -hmm. No more Ash. New characters. It's actually really good. It is still a kid's show, but it isn't a like kiddie show. It's yeah. more... Yeah, Teenager, yeah. <laughs> really cool. I've enjoyed it. I mean, that's some... one of the few places that's still giving us, you know, good media. Asia. <laughs> so it's true. Korea, Japan. India and, even as and well. And even some out of the ordinary Chinese films have actually fun CGI and they're dumb, but they're actually flicks. And so, oh my gosh, look at where Western media is at, people. It's just... <sighs> <laughs> so, uh, um, Gazette Dragon uh, donates five dollars. Thank you, mate. Uh, Jason Batari for five dollars says Shad and Terry Crews should be in be should be cast in the reboot of Twins, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. You, I agree because like Terry Crews and me, I just I, I feel a connection with that man. He's like. Uh, I feel like if that ever happened, people who know you would be so excited, but everyone else who doesn't would be so confused. They're like, why is this castle guy with all these like big celebrities? Do you want to do this one? Sure. sure. The, uh, the Huron, Huron the Steadfast for 550 Canadian. Hail Shadow Nathan. I've been playing Kingdom Come Deliverance. Absolutely loving it. Uh, my kingdom is for a archery... Re ridicule? Ridicule, right? I think. I Awesome. And... I've been having a bit of a craving to go back to Mountain Blade again. Mountain Blade is just, I can, I can come back to that game and it's fun. Cameron Darren Cameron for 999 says, Nate and Shad to karaoke. Life, life cuts like an Omni Blade here in all Space Void Spawn Void Lords. Uh, data Plague, it's an all race. Might rise to prominence and fight the dominance. Star Tales. Ooh. That was a really good run. I oh. see what you did there. <laughs> Gazette Dragon for ten dollars says, "Chad, it's thanks to you at Scarlegrim that I'm working on a book and wanted to know if it's okay for me to use some quotes and use in your YouTube videos. Absolutely, I'd be my honour, sir. Thank you." Uh, Patrick Ells for five dollars says, "Well, Nathan, many of us are huge bookworms who love gigantic saga-like books like Wheel of Time. I'm currently reading thir a thirty-plus book series." I agree with you. I understand where you're coming from, but Saga. I want to not feel so tired already from the long journey. Saga. I want tales. Okay, I want little bedtime stories I can read to my kids. <laughs> uh, Iron, Iron Garrison, $5, says, Just a quick question about the Kickstarter for Shadow of the Conqueror. I haven't heard anything for a while, and I never really um, asked for delivery info when I pledged. So I've given multiple different updates as things progress. We, we are still you know, in the uh, working with printer fulfillment phase, okay? And uh, there's been, again, frustrating uh, delays. This is why we did the Kickstarter, because we could put it out there um, and give a second chance for people who hadn't had the opportunity to get it. it, it it's a complicated process. Well, don't worry, we haven't forgot. Like, I'm 
very, very determined to uh, get this done. And the money from the campaign, it's in a separate account. We are not touching it until the fulfillment's done. The only money that has been cut out of it is production and, you know, stuff that obviously needs to be paid for to get this stuff done. Um, but we, we're, all, we're working on it. Um, New, Doc New, New Doc Prime? Yeah. Yep. For uh, 2 GPD, uh, will you review the HBO Gremlins cartoon trailer? I didn't even know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have to? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cameron Durant Cameron for uh, two USD head cannon. P, uh, head can head. Oh my gosh. Ken head can cans. <laughs> oh my gosh. Why? <laughs> Don't, it's always your comments too that get me. Ken head cannons pierce plot armor. No. Uh, Juan Wong for twenty dollars says. My lords, I wish to thank you for previously shouting out previous previously shouting out previously on Clownfish TV. Please allow me to apologize on behalf of my master regarding the wait in getting your copy of Crimson Wren printing delays. However, uh, yeah, I've ordered Crimson Wren. Can't wait to get it. Um, and Clownfish TV, they do great work. Um, awesome stuff. I think those continued for that. And Juan Wong for another twenty dollars says the exact same thing. Um, is it the same thing? Uh, different. Uh, it's different. a continuation. However, if my lords desire, I can bring a test read copy of previously on Clownfish TV for your reading enjoyment. For anyone else, would this be to your liking? Neon has tagged me recently in this tweet. Thank you. That's fine. I'm perfectly happy to, uh, you know, wait for when they can uh, get the print, print and fulfillment done on that. I understand the delays that can happen when you're working with printers. And so they'll get it done when they're able to get it done. And I'll be very happy to receive it whenever it, get, it comes to me. And I'm looking forward to it. Crimson Red looks great. Um, so Kickerman twenty dollars says, "Hey Shad, hope your health is soyful." Question: Do you believe the following statement? God in Christ, Christ in man, man over woman, man over children. Wonder how your Mormon versions look like. Uh, and he says, "I'm ignorant." And so our own faith, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, we believe God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost are three individual beings, separate beings. Okay, Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, uh, spiritually, and of course, you know. He was the son of God on earth and the Holy Ghost is a separate being. Okay. Uh, we, so that, that's our belief of what we call the Godhead versus the Trinity. Mm. Um, but Jesus Christ, we absolutely believe is the savior. Okay. Form the atonement and only through him can we uh, be forgiven of our sins and stuff. And so uh, this statement sounds a bit Trinitarian. Um, uh, and so I, it depends on, because it could be interpreted in multiple different ways based on how that is. Uh, and so... I would need to know what the interpretation or intent is behind the phrasing. Okay. Reyes. 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 Madrid. Bay <laughs> Dollar says, Gideon should have taken Din's helmet off immediately after capturing him to humiliate and disarm him. But no Pedro on set would have made sense though. I mean, it's like the fact that Bogota can now have her helmet off and still be part of the helmet on clan. She, she walks both worlds now. And, uh, come off it. Hmm. Okay, you could be a bit good and a bit bad, hey? I'd starting to get those impressions from that. Do you want to get this one? Uh, the Patrick, Patrick Bateman for $5. Star Wars is dead. It's time to stop trying to revive a rotting corpse. But Disney, they're, well, they're not trying to revive Robert Rodding Corpse. They're doing something else to that Rodding Corpse. They're reanimating it. Not even that. They're, they're, they're shocking it. They're prodding it with a stick. They're doing what was done with real time, which is why I think we should promote this term. They are rafing it. They're rafing it, yes. Jason Batari for $5 says, Chad, I do astrophotography. I would gladly lend you some of my images for inspiration and scenery for your space opera. Inter I'm not... Not nearly up to that yet. And I appreciate the offer, sir. Thank you. Um, we'll have to see how we progress. So, da -da -da -da, Jason yeah. Batari. Yep. Uh, yeah. For $10 says, love all your content, guys. Uh, we'll be supporting as much as I can. Would love to get Shad's opinion on the movie Dragonheart. I love Dragonheart. That's my opinion. Saw it in the theaters as a kid and loved it. Still holds a place in my heart. Yeah, Dragonheart is epic. And by the way, as we're reaching the end of this, I want to mention this before I forget. Uh, Oz, okay, over on his channel, Team Oz, he likes to do kind of reaction 
uh, to our live streams and stuff. And he might be doing a reaction to this live stream. And so after the live stream ends, go over to Team Oz and see if he's doing that or, or if he's scheduled or something like that. And you get kind of like a, a, a live stream after party with him just cracking jokes and it's hilarious. And so go support Team Oz. We love Oz. Okay. Um, so are we up to this one? I yes. Yes. Jason Batari for ten dollars said, "Did I read that?" Yeah, that's the dragon. Yeah, Pino, yeah, sorry, so in fears. Yes. So Patrick, Patrick Bateman for two dollars says, "Chad, are you writing any more books?" Slowly, it's t- time is the issue. But yeah, I, I have a medieval fantasy um, that is half done. That I wish I could have more time to finish off, but it's there, and I definitely want to get want to uh, get more writing done. Uh, Irhimamin for fifty thousand IDR says, "Barbie movie is Barbie movie is coming, guys. Better to prepare." The pink shirts with Nathan and Simu Wu Tyrant as Ryan Gosling and Shad as Margaret Robbie. I'm not sure I'll make a great uh, Margaret Robbie. I I, I, I know we're going to go review that movie, but I really do not want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of them. Uh, Michael Duniev, sorry for pronunciation, for $10, says Stargate Universe kind of grew on me and I was disappointed it got cancelled so soon. How would you feel about a new Stargate show reboot? I'm mostly against any type of reboots in the modern day. <laughs> like 15 years ago. Yeah. Well, maybe. Cool. SG1 is so good. Hard to top it. Um, it. Like, if anything was able to be made good, of course I'd be on board. But nowadays, just like, just leave things alone. And it just shows how creative, creatively bankrupt Hollywood is at the moment. Because they are so... They, if they try and make new things, it gets cancelled season one, Netflix mm. constantly. And that Netflix is trying new things, but they just give up on it straight away. And then all the other places, yeah, they're like, it's really hard for them to make something new that's successful. You get the odd one out. Yellowstone is great. Really enjoy Yellowstone. Um, but still, they, they're just trying to go back to the old stuff because the more successful people like it more. Paul's pseudonym for 50 USD, thank you, man. Says, just finished watching your Carbon Fiber Blade video. There's more coming, like very soon. I love all your content and look forward to future content. Thanks, man. We appreciate that very, very much. And yeah, like, so the the last Carbon Fiber one ended with a bit of a tease, but that's because the next video is coming out very soon. Very soon. Very, very soon. And so I hope you guys look forward to that. And of course... A uh, bit of a shorter stream this time. We have a bit of work we need to get to today. Uh, Iron Carcass, this is it, for 200 SEK says, Hey, Shadow Nathan, have you read any of the contemporary bestsellers or award-winning sci-fi? Uh, I've been enjoying uh, Reich, Brown, Evan Curry, Jack Campbell, and Marco Kloos for years, and very little on TV holds a candle to them. Yeah, I, that's what I also like. There's some top-tier sci-fi literature out there. I, I I just don't have the time to get to all of it. Um, but someone's Ender's Game. Love Ender's Game and a lot mm. of the Ender's work. Speaking for the Dead. So also Scott Card, I love as well. I, um, uh, there's another sci-fi series. And now, was it Ark Royal? I can't remember. Might have been Ark Royal. But um, I can't remember who was the author. But uh, yeah, that was a fun sci-fi book that I read. Um, but again, time prevents me from getting it. But there are some top tier sci-fi, 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 sci-fi works out there. Uh, but wrapping up this live stream, we really wanted to share our thoughts on Picard and Mandalorian. We thank everyone who has joined us on this one. And of course, we hope we'll see you on the next uh, future episodes here on the Watch What We Do, the live streams that we'll get to. So as always, stay on watch. Mm-hmm.